الحمد لله وكفى والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى اما بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله احد سبحان ربك رب العزه عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا وحبيبنا ونبينا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا وحبيبنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in this hadith which is in Ahmad in Abu Da'ud it said that an Abdullah ibn Umar wa Abdullah ibn Amr قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لا يأتين على أمتي كما أتى على بني إسرائيل حذو النعل بالنعل حتى إن كان منهم من أتى أمه على نية لكان في أمتي من يصنع ذلك He said that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "La yatiyanna ala ummati kama ata ala bani Israel hazwa al-na'l bil-na'l." That a time will come on in my ummah like it came on Bani Israel. Hazwa al-na'l bil-na'l, just like one shoe is to the other. Just like there's a pair of shoes. So one shoe and another shoe, they're exactly the same. It's just that one is the right foot and the other is the left foot. He said that a time will come on my ummah that it will be exactly like Bani Israel, just like a shoe is to the other shoe. Hatta inkana min inkana min hum man ata ummahu ala niyatan, la kana fi ummati man yasna udalika. So much so. that if any of them had come to his mother openly then there will be somebody from my ummah who will do the same and then he said wa inna bani israil tafarraqat ala thintayni wa sab'ina millatan that bani israil they divided into 72 groups وَتَفْتَرِقُ أُمَّتِي عَلَى ثَلَاثِ وَسَبْعِينَ مِلَّةٍ كُلُّهُمْ فِي النَّارِ إِلَّا مِلَّةً وَاحِدَةً And my ummah will distribute into 73 groups. My ummah will distribute into 73 groups. كُلُّهُمْ فِي النَّارِ All of them will be in fire. إِلَّا مِلَّةً وَاحِدَةً Except one group. The Sahaba got very, very worried. They said, "Qalu man hiya ya Rasulullah? Which will be that group, ya Rasulullah?" Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Qala ma ana alayhi wa ashabi. What I am on and what my Sahaba are on. So though that group which are on the path of the Prophet of Allah, Sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and and. the path of the sahaba radi allah ta'ala anhum ajma'in that one group will be in paradise rawahu tirmidhi wa fi riwayat ahmad wa abi daud an mu'awiyata sanatan wa sab'un fi an-nar wa wahidah fi al-jannati and so this is in tirmidhi in the jami' of Imam Tirmidhi rahmatullahi alayhi and there is another riwayat in Ahmad bin Abi Dawood 
from Sayyidina Mu'amiyah radiyallahu anhu, he said that 72 will be in fire and one will be in paradise. So what does that mean? The question is, what does that mean? 72 groups in the fire, one group in paradise. Many people, they think that the mazahib that we have in fiqh and jurisprudence, like following the school of Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi and Imam Shafi'i rahmatullahi alayhi and Imam Malik rahmatullahi alayhi and Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahmatullahi alayhi that these are those groups. This is not about that. Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhu ajma'in, they differed in their fiqh. They differed in their rulings. They differed in coming up with a ruling from the Quran and Hadith. For example, once Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to a group of Sahaba that who were going were sent to a town he said that you are all going to that town. So you go and pray. You pray Asr in that town. You pray Asr in that town. So while the Sahaba were going to that town, they got late, they got delayed, and the time was for Maghrib was about to enter. So Sahaba, now they differed in their opinion. Some said, oh, you know, time of Maghrib is about to come, let's pray Asr. But some other Sahaba said, but the Prophet wasallam said that pray Asr in that town. So there were two groups. There were two groups. So one said that no, Prophet wasallam ordered us that we must pray Asr in that town. So we must go. It does not matter if the time of Maghrib enters in. It is the order of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He even anyway, he gave us the first order to pray Asr and Maghrib. So if he's ordering again that we have to pray Asr in that town, so you must pray Asr in that town. So what, what does, I mean, it does not matter at all that if it, that time of Maghrib comes in. And the other said, no, no, in reality he meant that we should reach there in time for Asr. Yani we should hurry up. We should reach there in time for Asr so that we pray Asr there. So there were two groups. So a part of the Sahaba prayed Asr on their way, yani without reaching that town, because they thought that Prophet in reality, he meant that we should reach there in time for Asr. The other said, no, that literally that's what he meant. So they did not pray Asr even though the time of Maghrib came in. They went there. They prayed Asr after the time of Maghrib. So both of them later came to back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, told them, told him their story. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you both were right. You both were right what you did. And it was your istihad. It was your coming up of a ruling based on what I said. Based on what I said, both of you understood differently. Does not matter, it happens. It's okay. It is just one example. There are numerous examples. Numerous, numerous, numerous examples. This is not just one example. So, coming up with a ruling based on Quran and the Hadith and the Sunnah and the Ijma of the Sahaba, based on what Sahaba did, they're all fine. They're all okay. And that's where the difference of opinions in the rulings come in. That's where these schools were formed because they were different in their principles. The principles of jurisprudence were different for all of these. Nothing wrong with that. They all come in the category of ma ana alayhi wa ashabi. That what I am on and what my sahaba were on. There's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. And that is why the people of the truth, they are called ahlu sunnah wal jama'ah. Ahlu sunnah wal jama'ah. What does it mean? One group that will be in the paradise are who? Ma ana alayhi wa ashabi. 
whatever uh, what the path that I am on and the path that my Sahaba are on. Ahlu Sunnah, the people of Sunnah, the people of the Prophet ﷺ, wal jama'a, and the group. Which group? The group of Sahaba. If somebody takes out the element of Sahaba from the equation, they are not from that one group. If somebody only follows Quran, sorry, but you are deviated. Somebody only follows Hadith, sorry, but you are deviated. Which is that one group? Ma ana alayhi wa ashabi. What I am on and what my Sahaba are on. Very important principle. That you cannot take the, the Sahaba out from the equation. So if Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu had an ishtihad later on in his, yani in his time of caliphate, and all the Sahaba agreed to what he was to say, then that is ma ana alayhi wa ashabi. We cannot take Sahaba out of the equation. Only Hadith does not suffice. Which will be that one group? Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ma ana alayhi wa ashabi. Sahaba are part of that equation. So, what does it mean then? If the difference of opinions in the fiqh are fine, so what is the issue? The issue is aqidah. The issue is aqidah. We have to have the aqidah of the Prophet ﷺ and the aqidah of the Sahaba. We have to have that. All of us. That will be that one group which will enter into paradise. There cannot be any major differences in that. There cannot be any major differences in that. It cannot be tolerated. The difference of opinion in in rulings, the rulings of jurisprudence, the rulings of fiqh, nothing wrong with that as far as they are based on valid principles. That's another important thing. As far as they are based on some valid principles. But... Not everybody can become a mufti. I cannot come up with a fatwa. I cannot come up with a ruling of my own because it's not based on a valid principle. If it is based on valid principles, these four imams and others, and those schools died their own death with the passage of time, what remained were those four schools. What in reality those four schools were? They were schools <laughs> of thought. Yet they were principles. There were four principles based on which they derived uh, uh, from Quran, from Sunnah, from the Sahaba, from the Ijma of the Sahaba, from the consensus of the Sahaba. And of course, when they did not find any uh, from these three sources, then they came up with analytical reasoning based, still based on Quran, still based on Hadith, Sunnah, yani, and still based on the Ijma of the Sahaba. If they did not find something, they came up with a ruling based on reasoning. But these based on these three sources. Understood? So, there's nothing wrong with that. But there cannot, the, the aqidah, the belief, the iman that we have to believe in cannot be tolerated. There can, there can only be one. There can only be one. And that's what we need to know, that what is that aqidah, that iman, that, the, that Prophet wasallam had and what Sahaba had. Initially, you know that nobody actually made it a syllabus, aqidah, iman, what do you need to believe in? Nobody. So the Prophet ﷺ didn't do that, Sahaba didn't do that. For them, Surah Al-Ikhlas was enough. Qul Allah ahad. Allah is one. Say Allah is one. That was their aqidah. That is it. They did not know, need to go into all of the details. Amantu billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rusulihi wal yawm al-akhiri wal qadri khayrihi wa sharrihi min Allahi ta'ala wal ba'si ba'd al-mawt was their aqeela. I believe in Allah and His and His angels and His messengers and His books and the destiny, the good of it and the bad of it is all from Allah and raising up in the last day and raising up after death, this was their aqeedah. 
That's all what they had to follow. That's, that's it. The problem arose later on. Problem arose at the time after Sayyidina Usman radiallahu ta'ala anhu was martyred. That was the time when the problem actually started creeping in the ummah. Sayyidina Usman radiallahu ta'ala anhu when he got martyred. So Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu was made the Khalifa. And there were there was a difference of opinion between Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidina Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala anhu that what should we be what should we should do in taking revenge from the people who martyred Sayyidina Usman. So there was a difference of opinion. One group said that we should take revenge. Others said no. Because there is a possibility of a bigger fitna. So there was a difference of opinion. And there, if this, I mean, if you have read history, Islamic history, that was a big difference of opinion. So much so that were the two very different groups, very, I mean, they were very opposing each other, and they actually had a fight on this very topic because the big, it was a very, very big thing. So there was a group who just deviated, who formed one small little group. And they were neither of the two. And they made a small little group. And these people were called Khawarij. Khawarij. So they went into a village under the leadership of a person called Abdullah ibn Wahab al rasibi And they were joined with another group and they made their own group. So they were called Khawarij. Yani they just exited from the mainstream Islam, from the mainstream Aqeedah of the Muslims. And then they came up with very strange ideas in Aqeedah. They came up with few like, for example, they said that actions are an integral part of faith. Okay, before I tell that, there is a difference of opinion even amongst the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah as to what is the definition of Iman. As to what is the definition of Iman, of, of belief, of faith. Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi, he says that the Iman as defined as, defined as tasdiqun bil qalb. It is just justification of the heart. Believing in Allah, this belief, believing in the messengers, I know, I believe that there are there are messengers that Allah Ta'ala sent. Believing, believing in the angels, I believe that they're angels. They're angels that sit on my shoulders and they're writing every single thing that I do. I believe in that, etc. Believing in the books of Allah, believing in the destiny. He said that it's all about the heart. You believe in your heart and that is Iman. That's it. As per the definition. But, then they say that it will be good and it will just give it some sort of uh, strength that if you also testify it with the tongue but that is not as the definition of of iman definition of iman is this but it is confirmed by testification of the tongue by affirmation with the tongue that you believe in your heart that Allah Ta'ala is one and Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the messenger and you also say it with the tongue. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. I say it with the tongue as well. So this is good to do that. It will give it that strength that you affirm it or you just you, you, you justify it with your tongue. It's good to do that. But it's not as say uh, uh, you can't say that it is a definition of Iman. Iman is in your heart. That's what he says. Their Dalil is that Hadith Jibra'il that I was mentioning last night. That when Sayyidina Jibra'il Islam came to the Prophet Sallallahu asked him a few questions. So when he said, what is Iman? What did Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say? An tu'minu. What is that? He said that, فَأَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ الْإِيمَانِ قَالَ أَن تُؤْمِنَ بِاللَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ وَكُتُبِهِ وَرُسُلِهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَتُؤْمِنَ بِالْقَدْرِ خَيْرِهِ وَشَرِّهِ That's it. That you have believed. 
in all of these. So he said that, but Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, this is Iman, so Iman is of the heart. It's bil qalb. You testify all of this in your heart. But it is good that you also say it with your tongue. Imam Shafi'i Rahmatullahi Alayhi and other Fuqaha and Muhaddisin, they say that there is another, so these two are there, but there is another factor that is added on to that, and which is A'malun bil jawari, your actions. Your actions. You also need to act in order to show that you have Iman. So you, you testify it in the, with your heart, you believe it in the heart, you testify it with the tongue, and you also act. Then if Allah Ta'ala says that you pray five times a day, just saying with your tongue, La ilaha illallah, and not actually praying, in other words, you have no iman. In other words, you have no iman. But this iman, this, so this is what I wanted to, uh, to talk about. But this does not take you out of the folds of Islam if you don't act. There is a little difference. It does not take you out of the folds of Islam or Iman if you don't act. So somebody says La ilaha illallah, believe it in the heart. If he does not pray five times a day or, or does not fast a month of Ramadan, he does not become kafir. He does not become kafir. Action is necessary for the beautification of your Iman. So understand the difference. It's not an integral part of Iman. In other words, if somebody does not act, he does not become a kafir. According to Imam Shafi'i Rahmatullahi. What? You know, in reality, it is only the difference, a very subtle difference in the definition. Even Imam Abu Hanifa Rahmatullahi says that actions are necessary. But def definition of Iman, that's all what he is differing on. Definition of Iman. He's saying that Iman is defined as tasdiqun bil qalb. It's better to have iqrarun bil lisan. And of course, you, ha you will, it will give it, it, it uh, even further beauty if you also have actions. But the def definition of Iman is only that you believe it in the heart. Imam Shafi Rahmatullah says, no, 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 all three are inclusive. But the actions are not an integral part of Iman. So in other words, if somebody does not act, he will not become a kafir. Understood? So, the Khawarij, they said the same thing, that Iman is justification of the heart, is believing in the heart, justification it with the tongue, affirming it with the tongue, confirming it with the tongue, and actions, but... But if somebody does not act, in other words, he is doing a kabira sin, a major sin, he is out of the fold of Islam. And their proofs are all of these ahadiths, la iman ali la amanat alahu. There is no iman for those who does not have amanats, who do not keep the trust. So they say, oh, what is Prophet saying? La imana. There is no iman. Liman la amanat alahu. Or, man taraka salatan muta'amidan faqad kafara. Whoever leaves prayer intentionally, he has indeed disbelieved. So they said that it is part of iman, in, in, and it's an integral part of iman, and if somebody leaves the actions, he will become kafir. So that was an extreme view. It was never the view of the Sahaba. It was never the view of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. These are, these mean what Imam Shafi was saying, Imam Hanifa Rahmatullah was saying, that actions adorn the Iman. It gives that beautification to Iman. It tells that this Iman is true, but does not take people out of the folds of Islam if people do not act on, uh, on the Faraid. If they do not fulfill the mandatory acts in our deen, people do not go out of the fold of Islam. So these khawarij, they were very extreme. They were extreme. They said, whoever will do major sins, he's out of the fold of Islam, etc. And there were other uh, extremist views as well. So here, this was the first group that actually started deviating from the aqidah. No, this is a belief thing. It's an aqidah thing. Right? That person not acting, he is out. He's kafir. Very extreme view. So the, the Khawarij were the first ones. 
And these Khawarij were very, very cruel people. They went and they actually, because of their extreme views, they were, they were very strict people. They are very, very strict people. And you see all of these people like, uh, you know, Hajjaj bin Yusuf and other people who were of very, very extreme views. There, were, there was another group that came. They were called Mu'tazila. Mu'tazila. You know, there was a man called Wasil bin Atta. He was sitting in the circle of Sayyidina Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah ta'ala, who was a tabi'i. And there was a theological dispute that happened. And the dispute was that what about those people who, yani who, who sin? They're people of Iman, but they sin. So this person said that they are going there, they will be in a place which is manzilatun bain al manzilatain. They will be in a station between, between the two stations. Yani they will neither be punished nor be rewarded. There is a third position. Sayyidina Hassan Basri rahimahullah ta'ala, he got very angry at that very statement. He said, what are you talking about? This is not our iman, this is not our aqidah. So he uh, stood up and he left. So Sayyidina Hassan Basri rahimahullah ta'ala said, e'tazala, e'tazala, that he has distanced himself, he has, uh, he has uh, cut off from us. So this was the first man, and he went and he formed a group, and that's why they are called Mu'tazilas. They are Mu'tazilas. They isolated themselves. Very, very extreme views as well. And some of the things that they mentioned, for example, which were against the core beliefs of the Prophet wasallam and the Sahaba, is that, that there are no at- attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sifat. He said, if we agree to all of the sifat of Allah, that means that there will be more than one God. That's what they claim. So that, he said, they, they deny the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then, they also said, for example, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because they did not believe in the sifat, they say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have the attribute of knowledge. Irada, will, and sight, basa. So they say that, you know, Allah Ta'ala only knows through His essence, through His Zat, and not through Sifat. And they also denied the, the vision of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in the paradise. They said, you know, we cannot look at Allah Ta'ala. These were all the aqaid that were against the aqaid, the beliefs of the Prophet Sallallahu and the Sahaba. And then they also said that Allah Ta'ala, He created His speech in a body. Yani the Qur'an is not the, uh, the kalam of Allah, but rather it is a creation. And subhanAllah, you know, uh, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah Ta'ala, he stood against that. And because these Mu'tazilas were very close to the, to the elites, to the to the politicians, to the Umarah. So they were really getting a lot of support from them. And that's why Imam Ahmad ibn Hamad, rahimahullah ta'ala, he was put into jail for that. He was lashed. So, anyway, so this group was coming up as a big, big group. Then there were other groups that were forming. Like, for example, there was one group called Qadariya. And the idea, ideology of Qadariya, which is shared by Shias as well, and also Mu'tazilas, that both they denied that Allah Ta'ala create evil, but rather they said that man has the ability to create evil. Yani Allah Ta'ala has only limited powers, Ma'azallah, as it. Then there was a group called Jabariya, and the belief of Jabariya was exactly opposite to Qadariya. They said that people are forced. People are forced into things. Yani they cannot, they do not have any free will. They cannot do good deeds and they cannot do bad deeds. So everything that they do is forced. And Jabr has happened. They are forced into things. Understanding. So they are called Jabariya. That was also against the mainstream Aqidah. And then there was a group called Jahmiya. And Jahmiya, 
they also rejected the sifat of Allah Ta'ala, the, the, the divine attributes of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. They were the first ones actually who said that the Qur'an was created. They, they were the first ones. And then they also said that the paradise and the hell are transient. They are transient things. There was a group called Karamiya. The Karamiya, they were uh, anthropomorphous. They said Allah Ta'ala Ma'azala is a mujassama. He said Allah Ta'ala actually rests on the, on the throne. They said, you know, he is above in the physical direction. And there are physical movements, displacements, dissension for Allah Ta'ala. Yani they actually believe literally that this is all what's happening. So, yani Allah Ta'ala has a jism. So, etc. Now, none, majority of these, I would say, majority of these groups do not exist. Majority of these groups do not exist. But, it might be ringing a bell in your head. You still hear some of these things. You some still hear some of these things. Right? So people are still exist, call themselves reformists, that they have reformed the deen, they have, you know, confirmed what's, Prophet ﷺ came with, and they share some of these thoughts. That's why it's problematic. That they are, these aqaid, these beliefs are against the mainstream aqaid. So because all of these were coming, all of these groups were emerging, there was a need at that time that aqidah, creed, Theology had to be formalized. There was a need at that time. As I said in the beginning, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he never did that. None of the Sahaba did that. They never formalized that. Their belief was, Qul hu Allah ahad. Allahu la ilaha illa hu al hayyul qayyum was their aqidah. They were very, very simple people. And that's all what they needed. That's all what we need as well in reality. That's all what we need. But because of these people creeping in, these groups creeping in, there was a need at that time that somebody had to formalize the points and they, somebody must write down the, 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 the aqaid, the aqidah, the beliefs of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And there was a need that they must refute they must refute as to what uh, these people were coming with. So, there were a few people who actually started writing the points of Aqidah. The first of those, or one of the first of those, was nobody but Imam Abu Hanifa. He did a great service. In every field of, of deen, in every field of religion. And of course, he did not leave Aqidah. And he wrote a book called Al Fiqh Al Akbar. Al Fiqh Al Akbar. Today we only know Fiqh as jurisprudence. But Fiqh, what does it mean? Fakuha Yafkuhu. It means deep understanding. There's a Fakiha Yafkahu and there's a Fakuha Yafkuhu. There it comes with two bars, people who are studying Arabic. So, Fakuha Yafkuhu means, Bab from Bab Karuma, is that deep understanding. Deep understanding. So, understanding can be of anything. Understanding can be of, of uh, the rulings. Understanding can be under Aqidah. Understanding can be in Tafsir. Understanding can be in anything in Arabic language. So, Fiqh was, in the, in the early times, were used for all of these sciences. And that's why he wrote this book of Aqidah, it's called Al-Fiqh Al-Akbar. Al-Fiqh Al-Akbar, the greater understanding, the biggest understanding. The understanding that everybody needs to know, and this is the biggest thing that you can know. What is that Aqidah? Belief in Allah and, and all of the things that we believe in. And he came up, he actually, just all what he did was, that he, he wrote down the, the points of Aqidah, 
that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had and the Sahaba had. That's all what he did. And then there were a few more people because these Mu'tazilas were, you know, at their extreme at that time. So there were two people who actually stood up. I would say three. Three people stood up. One was Imam Tahawi Rahimullah Ta'ala. And I'll talk about him in a minute because the book that inshallah ta'ala we plan to cover in the next day and a half is his book, Imam Tahawi's book. I'll talk about that in a minute inshallah, in a few minutes. Imam Tahawi Rahimullah Ta'ala, just to, just to give you one point, that he wrote this book in a very, very simple way. Very simple way. All what he did was he came up with these points and he said that these are all the things that we will need to believe in. And if you look into the book that if you, you are given, there are 130 <laughs> points, 130 points that he wrote. It depends, you know, this book that we have, you know, it is divided into 130 group points. It was never written like that. It was like a text. And then, you know, this, uh, the author here, he is just splitting that into different points. And... At the end, it's coming out to be 130 points. Let's put it, take it as 130 points. So he put all of these points, uh, all of these things that we need to believe in point by point, and that's it. That's all what he did. He never gave any proofs. He never had any, uh, you know, any, any logical reason. He's not giving any logical reasonings or any sort of philosoph philosoph philosophical reasonings or anything like that. He's not doing that. Very simple book, extremely simple book, and that is the Aqidah of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. That is the Aqidah of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Very straightforward book, and because of its simplicity, this has been the mostly the the book that has been accepted the most by Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, and that's what people normally teach, and that's what people normally learn in Madaris, because of the simplicity of that. So he was one of those who came up with the points of Aqidah. And he wrote this book, Al-Aqidah al tahawi And I'll talk about the book, inshallah, in a few minutes. But there were a few, two other people who also put down the points of Ahl-Sunnah wal Jama in Aqidah. But on top of that, what they did was they actually refuted, especially the Mu'tazilas. Because they were, as I said, were the largest group at that time and they were a very strong group. And they, they had the favors of the of the Umarah, the 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 rulers or politicians of that time. So they gave, they refuted them. And they they came up with a very complicated text. One of them was Sayyidina Ali ibn Ismail ibn Abi Bishr al-Ash'ari al-Yamani al-Basari. He was born in 260 Hijra, died in 324. Imam Ash'ari, rahimahullah ta'ala. So he, subhanAllah, he was a Mu'tazili. He believed in the Aqaid of Mu'tazilat. And he was a very, very big scholar of Mu'tazilat. Their star scholar, if you want to say that. And he was like, what? he held a very big post in Mu'tazilat. And subhanAllah, it is, there are different things that are written in the books. One thing that is written in the books is that once in one of the Ramadan, he, Prophet, he, he saw Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his dream. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said to him, Imam Ashari, his, his kunya was Abu Hassan, Abu Hassan al Ashari, rahimahullah ta'ala. That, you know, that, what are you doing? What are you believing in? And he saw him for three consecutive nights. So he started researching, then he realized, and he started looking into what Mu'tazilas really actually believed in. And he did not come out of his house for 15 days. And after 15 days, he came out and he went on to the member and he refuted Mu'tazilat. He said, you know, I was used to be their biggest scholar. This is a post that I held. And he said, 
that I am going to separate from Mu'tazilah. He said, just like I'm separating this garment of mine from me. And he was wearing a gown and he took that gown off and he threw it. So he was the he, he was Mu'tazili, but he refuted Mu'tazilas. And he then came up with this book. He came up with this book and he put all of these points of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. So because he was the first one who put down the uh, the points of Aqidah of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, so the people who followed his text, they were called Ashari. Abu Hassan al Ashari, Rahimullah Ta'ala, people who just took his book and they started following whatever he wrote down, they were called Ashari. So in Aqidah, they say that he follows the Aqidah of Ashari school of thought. Because he was the one who was doing that. And there was another man, may Allah have mercy on them, Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Mahmud Abu Mansur al Maturidi. He was in Maturid, which is a district of Samarkand, you know, in the Central Asia, today is around Uzbekistan. He was also the one who wrote down the points of Aqidah. And he was basing his points of the text that Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, he put down initially. And what he put down, and they were doing the work at the same time. Again, he was refuting the Mu'tazilas. Imam Ashari, rahimahullah ta'ala, was refuting the Mu'tazilas. So their texts were very, very deep. And both of them were doing the thing, the, this work at the same time without knowing that that's what they're doing. And subhanAllah, they come up with mostly the similar points. Exactly the same point. And people who researched later on as to how their text looked like, they said that in reality the difference is in 12 points. The difference is, is only in 12 points. And those 12 points are also not like major differences. It is like saying a thing in a, in a different way. That's all what it is. So Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah took the ideology, the creed, the theology of these two people. Of Abu, uh, Abu Hassan al-Ashari rahimahullah ta'ala and Abu Mansur al-Maturidi rahimahullah ta'ala. And people who actually took his text were called Maturidis. So when you hear oh, somebody follows the Aqidah, Ashari Aqidah or somebody follows Maturidi tariqah, the, uh, sorry, uh, Aqidah, in reality this is what it is. They are just the points of the Aqidah of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah and because these two people, they put it down they're, you know, they're, they're called Ashari, Ashari Aqidah and Maturidi Tariqah. There is nothing more to that. Imam uh, Abu Hassan al-Ashari, rahimahullah ta'ala, he followed, he was uh, in fiqh, he followed Shafi'i school. He followed Shafi'i school. And Imam uh, Abu Mansur Maturidi, rahimahullah ta'ala, he was Hanafi. He, was Hanafi. he followed Hanafi school in his fiqh. So, subhanAllah, I mean, there's always, you know, feel that soft corner. So, if you see, most majority of the Hanafis, they will take the text of Abu, uh, Abu Mansur Maturidi, rahimahullah ta'ala, and you see most of the Shafis, they will take the text of Abu, uh, Abu Hassan al-Ashari, rahimahullah ta'ala. But, you know, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Majority of them, they do it, but then, you know, there might be some who will, who will take the text of others they might have. It's all about what they have studied in their madaris, that's all. But, but in the majority of the cases, the Hanifis will study the text of uh, Abu Masur Maturidi, and majority of the Shafis would study the text of Abu Hassan al-Ashari, rahimahullah ta'ala. And there are few, by the way, just to few Hanifis, few Shafis, and it's for people who follow Shafi school and Hanifi school in their fiqh, they also some of the very small group, they fall, they, you, could, you may find in the books that they find, they follow the Mu'tazila school. They follow the Mu'tazila school. So don't get, and if you inshallah, I'll give you the topic of studying it in more detail, so, so don't say, oh, you know, what did I tell you in, in this session. There are few people who did actually follow the Mu'tazila school, but this is always the case. It will happen, right? You cannot force everybody to one thing. 
But majority, I'm talking about the majority of the Hanafis have followed the Maturidi school, and majority of the Shafis have followed the Ash'ari school in theology. And Humblies, uh, they also follow Ash'ari school, majority of them. And again, remember, Ash'ari, Imam uh, Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari, he was in the midst of the Mu'tazilas who were with the politicians. He was in the midst of that. So he was the one who was very, very strong against them because he was refuting them in reality. So there is also, you would find in some of the texts that Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they follow Ash'ari school and they, they won't even mention the Maturidi school. So the reason is that that Maturidi school is sort of immersed in Ash'ari school, like when they talk, when they have to take one name. They will say, oh, they follow Ash'ari school and not, they will not take the name of Maturidi school. But as I said, they both are in reality one and the same thing. It's just that two different people, they came up with this uh, you know, idea of putting it down in a different way. And majority of the cases, they are the same, with the exception of very only 12 points. And as I said, these 12 points are also just a different way of saying the same thing. So this is another thing that you may only find the name of Ashari school in some of the texts when they are talking against Mu'tazilas and against other deviated groups. But Maturidi school is also part of that. So also remember that. Understanding everybody is with me. So um, this morning should be awake, huh? I'll ask you. Inshallah ta'ala. This is the, I, I hope that this is the, this, the only academic session. Inshallah, I'll try to make it more spiritual going forward, Inshallah. Like, and this is necessary. The, we need to understand the basics of it. We need to understand that what is this all about. Now, Imam Tahawi, rahimahullah ta'ala. <coughs> he, as I said, was also in the same era. And he was, subhanAllah, His parents, he was born in 239 Hijra. And his, he was nursed by the wife of a great Hadith scholar, Abu Musa al-Misri, who is among the, uh, who is, uh, who learned from Abu Dawood, who learned from Nisai. And his mother was also a scholar. She was an alima. And her brother, yani the brother of the mother of Imam Tahawi, ta'ala, Imam Al-Muzanni, he was a direct student of Imam Shafi. Rahmatullahi. He was a direct student and he learned from Imam Shafi. Rahmatullahi alayhi. And he was very influential person in the Shafi'i school. Very, very influential person. So, his mother, Imam Tahawi's mother, she was referred to, you know, the sister of Al-Muzanni. So, the Shafi'i school was in the family. Very deep people. Yani they were the ones who were teaching Shafi'i school. And Imam Tahawi, rahmahullah ta'ala, he was brought up in that environment. He, his mother was an alima teaching Shafi school. His uncle, his mamu, was teaching Shafi school. Very prominent school, a direct student of Imam Shafi Ramatullah. You can feel that, right? That how much that must be in his blood. By the way, his name was Ahmad bin Muhammad bin Salman at tahawi Rahimullah Ta'ala. His kunya was Abu, uh, Abu Jafar. And, but subhanAllah what happened, there are different stories that are narrated. But he used to uh, study with his uncle. There are many stories. You might hear more stories as well. Allahu alam which one is the most correct one. But one thing that is mentioned that he would find that his uncle, he was a Shafi teacher, right? He was teacher of the Shafi school, direct student of Imam Shafi Ramatullahi. But he would see his uncle that sometimes that he would be doing his research, he would be looking into the Hanafi books. He'll be <laughs> so, so he started thinking, 
you know, how come that this is such a great scholar of a Shafi school, but to do his research, he will have to go and look into the school, the school of Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi. So he, mashallah, is a very intelligent man. So he started studying the Hanafi school. He started studying the Hanafi school. And then he, he just clicked in his mind that, you know, Hanafi school is logically, it appealed him more. Hanafi school, he said that it logically appealed me more. So he became a Hanafi. He became a Hanafi. He said, you know what, I, for me, Hanafi school is more logical. Hanafi school, the principles of Imam Hanifa Ali are stronger. So he became a Hanafi. And his uncle became very, very upset at him at that. He got, became very upset at that, you know, how come you are, you know, it's in the blood, you know, it's in our family, we are... We are the descendants of Imam Shafi Rahmatullah in terms of spirituality and subhanAllah you have deviated from us. So he got very upset at that. And he said that something, there is a narration that comes from Imam Tahabi Rahmatullah He said he began my studies with my uncle Al-Muzanni and followed the Shafi school and after several years Ahmad bin Abi Imran came to Egypt as a judge and began to accompany him and learn from him. He had acquired his legal knowledge from the Kufans, from Ahlul Kufa. Then he's a Hanifi. He said, I soon left my original opinions for his. Later I saw my uncle in my sleep. And he said to me, Oh Abu Jafar, oh Abu Jafar. He said, Abu Jafar has snatched you away. So there are other stories. But he became, he, so he started following the Hanafi school in his fiqh and became a great, great, great scholar of the Hanafi school. And he has written a lot of books. And one of the books, and he was a big muhaddis as well. He was a big muhaddis. And one of the books that we also uh, study in the final year of uh, our, al our you know, Alamiya course is one of his books, Shara Ma'ani Ul Athar. Which is then all the proofs that you, if you had to find of the Hanafi school there and there. All the ahadiths that the Hanafis take to prove their, uh, to give the dalil of their ahkam, they're all in there. So he has written that book, you know, with that perspective in his mind that he wanted to actually come up with all the ahadiths that are the proofs of the Hanafi school. So much, well, a very beautiful man, and he came up with this book, which is which is Al-Aqidah Al-Tahawiyah. So, Aqidah Al-Tahawiyah, Al-Aqidah Al-Tahawiyah, the name of the book, the full name of the book, is, اِعْتَقَادُ أَهْلِ السُنَّةِ وَالْجَمَاعَةِ عَلَى مَذْهَبِ فُقَهَاءِ الْمِلَّةِ أَبِي حَنِيفَةَ أَنْنُعْمَانِ إِبْنِ ثَابِتٍ الْقُوفِي وَأَبِي يُوسُفِ يَعْقُوبَ إِبْنِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ الْأَنْصَارِ وَأَبِي عَبْدِ اللَّهِ مُحَمَّدِ إِبْنِ الْحَسَنِ الشَّيْبَانِ So it is اِعْتَقَادُ أَهْلِ السُنَّةِ وَالْجَمَاعَةِ عَلَى مَذْهَبِ فُقَهَاءِ الْمِلَّةِ That it is the belief of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah on the mazhab of the fuqaha of this group, of this, of this, of this nation. On the school of thought of the jurist of this nation. So inshallah ta'ala we'll start with the book. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم العقيدة التهوية The creed of Imam Tahawi رحمت الله عليه It's not his creed, he just put down some points All right. I only follow Quran and Sunnah You follow somebody else SubhanAllah, what? An ignorant statement. These imams just put down the points. That's all what they did. They did not come up come up with anything of their own. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. All praises to Allah, who is the Lord of the universe, of all the worlds. Qala al-Allamatu Hujjatul Islami Abu Jafar. Al-Barraq al-Tahabi bi Misra rahimahullahu ta'ala. Al-Allama 
the most learned scholar, Hujjatul <coughs> Islam, proof of Islam. Hujjatul Islam. This is a beautiful title, by the way. Hujjatul Islam, the proof of Islam. Imam Ghazali, rahimahullah ta'ala, was also had the title of being Hujjatul Islam. Why are they called Hujjatul Islam? Proof of Islam. They're the proof of Islam because of who they were. And if you want to know that Islam is true, look at this man. If you want to know that Islam is true, look at this man. Just looking at this man, you will know that Islam is a true religion. They're the proof of Islam. And humanity can reach its pinnacle. Humanity can reach its pinnacle. And that can only reach its pinnacle by following this deen of Islam. And this is the man who has embodied all the principles of Islam in, his, in himself. And look at that. He has reached the pinnacles of humanity. He's a proof that Islam is a true religion. He's a hujjat of Islam. Abu Ja'far is his kunya. Al-Warraq, Al-Tahawi, be Misr, from Egypt, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, may Allah have mercy on him. So he says, هَذَا ذِكْرُ بَيَانِ أَقِيدَةِ أَهْلِ السُنَّةِ وَالْجَمَعَةِ This is the expression, or this is an exposition, or this is the writing, of the aqidah, the, the creed of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the people of Sunnah and Jama'ah, people of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Sahaba. Ma ana alayhi wa ashabi. Ala madhabi fuqaha il millati. In accordance with the understanding of the jurists of this nation, of the nation. Who are those? Abi Hanifa and Nu'man bin Sabit al Kufi, Abu Hanifa, Rahimullah Ta'ala, whose name was Al Nu'man bin Sabit from Kufa, and Abi Yusuf, Yaqub ibn Ibrahim al Ansari, and Imam Abu Yusuf, whose name was Yaqub bin Ibrahim al Ansari, Rahimullah Ta'ala, and Abi Abdullah, Muhammad ibn al Hassan al Shaybani, and Abu Abdullah, Abu Abdullah, was Imam Muhammad. Bin al Hassan al Shaybani, Radwanullahi alayhim ajma'in, may Allah be pleased with all of them. So, as I said, that the first, the first person who actually compiled or formalized the points of Aqidah was who? Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi and Nu'man bin Sabit al Kufi, rahimahullah ta'ala. And along with him is two big students, Imam Abu Yusuf and Imam Muhammad. Imam Abu Yusuf and Imam Muhammad, rahimahullah ta'ala, they were. The, the biggest students of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala. Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala had a group of 40 big, big scholars. He's a group of 40 scholars, huge scholars, big scholars. They were the experts in their field. But amongst those 40, the two top, top ones were Imam Abu Yusuf and Imam Muhammad rahimahullah ta'ala. So that's why he's mentioned the names of Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Abu Yusuf and Imam Muhammad rahimahullah ta'ala. That this is what they have come up with. This is what they have compiled, and my, what I'm going to put down here is in reality just a simplified way of, uh, of writing those points that they came up with. And then he says, وَمَا يَعْتَقِدُونَ مِنْ أُصُولِ الدِّينِ وَيَدِينُونَ بِهِ رَبَّ الْعَالَمِينَ He says it includes their beliefs. This book, it includes what they believed in, yani what the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah believed in, and upon which they base their worship of the Lord of the worlds. وَيَدِينُونَ بِهِ رَبَّ الْعَالَمِينَ And then he said, قَالَ الْإِمَامُ وَبِهِ قَالَ الْإِمَامَانِ الْمَذْكُورَانِ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى So Imam Tahawi رَحِمَهُ اللَّهُ says, وَبِهِ قَالَ وَبِهِ قَالَ means that with the chain of narration, that I, that these, the points of Aqaid have come to me from Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullah alayhi and Imam Abu Yusuf rahmatullah alayhi and Imam Muhammad rahmatullah alayhi. He said that, أَنَقُولُ فِي تَوْحِيدِ اللَّهِ مُعْتَقِدِينَ بِتَوْفِيقِ اللَّهِ That I'm going to, uh, that I would say about the Tawheed of Allah, 
about the oneness of Allah, about the unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, believing with the tawfiq of Allah, with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he started putting his points. So he says, number one, point number one in Aqeelah. He says that, Inna Allah wahidun la sharika lahu. That Allah Ta'ala is one. So we have to believe in, number one, that Inna Allah wahidun la sharika lahu. Allah Ta'ala is one and there is no partner of Him. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is one and there is nobody who is His partner. So the Imam Tahami Rahmatullah Alayhi, he put this as point number one in our Aqeedah. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. La ilaha illallah. Nobody can be a Muslim without believing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. He does not have any partners. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that as I said last night that inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bihi wa yaghfiru ma duna dhalika liman yasha. That Allah ta'ala says that I will not forgive that person. I will not forgive that person who associates a partner with me and I can forgive whoever that I may want. وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونِ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءَ It's the Mashiach of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We cannot say that we are indeed forgiven. It's the Mashiach of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if He wants, He can forgive anybody, but one sin that He will never forgive is <coughs> the shirk. Associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All the messengers, they came up with this one very message. لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ قُولُوا لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Say that there is no God but Allah. Every action, the qubuliyya, the acceptance of every action is based on la ilaha illallah. If people do whatever, they spend billions of dollars in charities, they leave everything and they go in the jungles, they do mujahidahs, they struggle with their own selves to get rid of all the diseases, they do whatever. And, but if they offer it, if they are offered this kalima la ilaha illallah, you believe that there is no God but Allah, and they reject it, all of their neck actions are null and void because there is no weight to their actions anymore. This is the key belief, la ilaha illallah. Key belief. One has to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the only Rabb, without any partners. Absolutely important. If anybody does not believe in that, there is no way to any of the action that he does. And as our Hazrat says that, you know, it's like people who have studied physics, is weight equals mass into gravi gravitational force. W is equal to mg. This is what we, I don't know, things change all the time. But this is a formula that we used to learn when we were in the school. Rahim, is it still the formula? He doesn't know physics. Suleiman? Huh? Yes. He's just nodding his head. Weight equals mg. Weight equals mass into gravitational force. We all have a mass. Somebody has more, somebody has less. But everybody has a mass. But say somebody goes on the, on the space and he will stand up on a weighing machine and he will be so happy that my weight is zero. Huh? And somebody who's standing on the weighing machine here and he will be scratching his head, oh my God, you know, I'm getting close to 70. Good guess. Huh? <laughs> so, somebody will be happy, somebody will be sad, possibly that I'm growing in my weight. Why? Because in space there is no gravitational force. There's no gravitational force. So whatever mass you have, it will be multiplied by zero and the weight will turn out to be zero. Right? This is exactly the scenario. If people have Iman, if people have Iman, that is that gravitational force. Mass are the actions. All the actions that we do, these are the mass. The Iman is the gravitational force. It all depends on what is that Iman. And in even people of Iman, it is not the same. The intensity of that Iman is not the same. The intensity of that iman is not the same. Some people do it with a lot of sincerity. 
Some people do it with a lot of sincerity, with a lot of ikhlas. Some people don't have the sincerity. All right, you know, I want to do it for Allah. But also it would be good that if somebody looks at me, that, oh, mashallah, how I pray. So there is lack of sincerity. So this G, that gravitational force, the intensity of that, the number would be different as well. So not everybody comes up with the same number. So maybe two rakas of prayer, say, right? Same mass, two rakas, same mass. But G is different. The gravitational force is different. The iman may be there, may not be there. Maybe even there is iman, there might be sincerity, there might be less sincerity. So the G is different. So the W is going to come out to be different. And weight is the thing that we all need. It's not about the actions. It's not about the quantity of the actions. It's going to be about the weight of the actions. Whoever's weight is going to be more. Whoever's wasn, the uh, wasn of the amal, the weight of the amal, are going to be more. Fahuwa fi isha the radia is going to be enjoying. But wa'amma man khaffat mawazinu, if the wazan is going to be less. Wa ummuhu haviya, his abode is haviya. Wa ma adraka mahiya, what do you know? How do you, what do you know what is it? Allah Ta'ala says, Narun Hamiya, blazing fire. It's all about it's all going to be about the weight. It's all going to be about the weight, not the quantity. And how do you get more weight? By making sure that Iman is there. And plus, ikhlas is there. That you do it for the sake of Allah Ta'ala alone. And that is why la ilaha illallah is number one thing because that is our gravitational force. If there is no gravitational force, the actions are going to be null and void. That is the first lesson that all messengers came, came. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he was ordered to go and spread the message, قُمْ فَأَنذِرْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْمُدَثِّرْ قُمْ فَأَنذِرْ Stand up and go and warn people. He went out and he gathered all of his family, all of the Quraysh, and he stood on top of Safa, the mountain of Safa, and he said, you know, that if I tell you that there's an army behind this mountain, will you believe in me? And everybody said, oh, you are a sadiq, you are the truthful, we never saw you lying in your life. We all believe in you. He said, you know what, I give you, I give you a message. If you believe in me, then I'll tell you, say, la ilaha illallah, tuflihu. You will, you will be successful. And then now they started saying, oh, what are you, this is why you've gathered us? And Abu Lahab, he said, you know, Ma'azallah, that may your hands be broken. Why did you, did this is what you call us for? And Allah Ta'ala then sent down the ayah, Tabbat yada abi lahabi wa May the hands of Abu Lahab be broken. So the first message has been, La ilaha illallah. The first thing that is said in the ears of a newborn baby, if it's a Muslim, is what? Allahu Akbar. First message. Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest. The first thing that a child should be speaking, Allah should be. Our mashaykh have always taught us that always make sure that you speak this word Allah, Allah, Allah in front of the child, Allah and infant, so that this should be the first word that he should be picking up. In fact, I've also read in the books that if a child speaks the first word as Allah, then the, all the sins of the parents are forgiven. So this is something rather than telling, you know, Mama, Baba, you know, Chika, Mama, Baba will come later, inshallah. First thing should be Allah. When he starts, he starts uh, reading sentences, the first thing that should be taught should be La ilaha illallah. And this should also be the last thing before people's death. What is that? La ilaha illallah. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that man kana akhiru kalamihi la ilaha illallah dakhal al-jannah. Whoever last words will be la ilaha illallah dakhal al-jannah he will enter paradise. Subhanallah. It's all about la ilaha illallah. That's why he came up with this first point as the first point. It comes about Imam Razi rahimahullah ta'ala was a big muhaddis. He 
was on his deathbed. And Muhaddisin, you know, he was, uh, he had memorized hundreds of thousands of ahadith. He was Hafiz al Hadith. In fact, the word Hafiz used to be only for the Muhaddisin. Now we say, oh, he's a Hafiz, uh, mashallah. It means that he's the Hafiz of the Quran. Initially, when we, they would talk about Hafiz, Hafiz meant the Hafiz of the Hadith, who had memorized more than 100,000 ahadith with asnad, with chain of narrators. Yani, oh, I heard it from this person, he heard it from that person, he heard it from that person, he heard it from that person, he heard it from the Prophet ﷺ. The whole chain, they would memorize the ahadith with the chain. So, he was on his deathbed, big muhaddis. So the students, you know, subhanAllah, they wanted to do talqeen, they wanted to remind him that, you know, the last word should be la ilaha illallah. So, but they thought, he is our teacher. He has been teaching us all his life. And now we teach, like, sort of remind him, reminding his teaching. Now we should remind him, say la ilaha illallah. So they were very, they were people of adab. They were not like me and you, who don't have any adab whatsoever. They were people of adab. This is also a tradition, adab. Of the teachers, of the shaykh, of the, of, you know, of the people of Allah. So, subhanAllah, they were thinking and they started feeling that, you know, his, his feet are getting, uh, uh, they're, they're losing life. And this is what happens when people start, the, the death, the rue starts going out, the first thing that becomes, uh, that, that, that lose it are the feet. When they saw it, now they were thinking what to do. To so somebody, they gave a mashwara, or he started reciting the sanad of this hadith. He said, وَبِهِ قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا You know, so the way the chain is, is recited. So he started reciting the chain. So now Imam Razi, rahimahullah ta'ala, was listening. He was listening, and that somebody is doing, as if somebody is doing the takrar of the hadith that he has taught. Look at the other. As somebody is repeating the sanad of the hadith that Imam Razi Ta'ala, he has taught to him. So he was reciting that slowly the, the sanad. The Subhanallah, he picked up right there. The Imam Razi Ta'ala, in the middle, he picked up the chain. He started reciting the chain from there. He said, oh, and you know, Haddasana Fulanun, Qala Haddasana Fulanun, Qala Haddasana Fulanun. And then he came to the matan of the hadith, the text of the hadith, and he said, Man qala, qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man kana akhiru kalamihi, whoever last words are, La ilaha illallah. And when he said that, his rude departed. <coughs> Subhanallah. It was a practical demonstration of Dakhal al-Jannah. Ajeeb people, subhanAllah. And we live in our own worlds of gossiping, of coffee parties and tea parties and this morning and that morning and our footballs and our basketballs and our crickets and that's all what we are engaged in. Not saying don't do that. But that should only be done, you know, with an intention of exercise, of relaxing a little bit. The goal is not this. Goal is la ilaha illallah. Goal is la ilaha illallah. So this is why he came up with this as his first point. Inna Allah wahidun la sharika lahu. Allah Ta'ala is one, there is no partner of his. He does not have a partner. You know, Tawheed, oneness, <coughs> is of three types. One is Tawheed fil uluhiyat. Tawheed fil uluhiyat. Two is Tawheed fil rabubiyat. And the third is Tawheed fil sifat. Oneness and uluhiyat. Uluhiyat, that Allah Ta'ala is our ilah. And nobody else is our ilah. Allah Ta'ala is our ma'bood. And there is nobody who is our ma'bood. What is ma'bood? The one who we worship. We worship only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is nobody who is worthy of worship except Allah. That's it. He should be the one that we should seek our help. That we should seek help from him. He's the only one that we should seek our help from. 
He is the one that we should go to. He is the one that we should fear. He is the one that we should we should have hope from. This is the heat fil uluhiya. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا نُوهِ إِلَيْهِ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنَا فَعْبُدُونَ That all the messengers that I've sent before you, O oh, my beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there was one message that I revealed to them, which is that لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنَا that there is no God but me, فَعْبُدُونَ that worship me. I am the only ma'bud. I am the only one who is worthy of worship. So this is Tawheed fil uluhiyyat. No, we cannot worship anybody. We cannot do sajda to anybody. We cannot bend down in front of anybody. We cannot. There are people who actually bend down in front of others. We are not supposed to bend down, bend down like doing ruku, sajda in front of people. We must do ikram of people, we must do we must honor people, people of Allah, but we must not worship anybody. There are people literally who do that, who sort of worship others. They don't say it, but they worship. There's some people who worship their nafs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that in the Quran. Allah ta'ala says, Ara'ayta alladhi. Ara'ayta man ittakhada ilahahu hawahu. Ara'ayta man ittakhada ilahahu hawahu. Have you seen that man? Who has taken his nafs as his ilah? Who has taken his nafs as his ilah? There is no tawheed fil uluhiyat. Nafs is his God. He worships his nafs. He worships his nafs. Subhanallah. Whatever nafs wants, I will do that. My life, my way. I've seen this slogan. Some people have put that in there. You know, they write you emails and they have, I don't know what is that, but there's a picture or something. It says, my life, my way. What is that? This is worshipping my nafs. I will do whatever I feel like. If I feel like, then I will get up for prayers. If I, I don't feel like, I want. Who are you to tell me? So Tawheed fil Uluhiyyah. There is no Ma'bud but Allah. And that Tawheed fil Rububiyyah. He is our only Rabb. He is our only Rabb. He is the one who has created us. He is the one who nourishes us. He is the one who gives us provision. There is nobody who gives us provision. Allah Ta'ala, He has cre- is the only one who has created us. Allah Ta'ala is the only one who nourishes us. Allah Ta'ala has put this in the heart of your, of the owner of your company or whoever has hired you that, you know, hire this man. Allah Ta'ala is ar razak That your, your, your boss isn't. Your company is not. It's Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala who makes those people, those companies, your means for, to provide you respite. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is the one who controls everything, nourishes everything, everybody. Everybody. And we'll talk about that in detail later on. But this Tawheed Phil Rabubiyat, he's our Rabb. Rabb, he's our Murabbi, the true Murabbi. They're, people are also Murabbi, yani they, they develop us, they do our Tarbiyat. But the true Tarbiyat is done by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is our Rabb. He nourishes us. He, he provides everything for us. The air, the sun, the moon, the stars, the rain. Everything is provided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank God that nobody can control the air. Otherwise, they will also charge for that. Huh? Something is free. Air is free. Sunlight is free. Because Allah ta'ala is in sole control of that. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. He is our Rabb. So Tawheed for Rububiyyah. No, nobody who nourishes us except Allah. Afillahi shakkun. 
Allah Ta'ala says, do you have a doubt in Allah? Fatir Samawati Wal Ard, who is the creator of the heavens and the earth? Do you have a doubt in that? SubhanAllah. And the third is Tawheed Fis Sifat. Tawheed Fis Sifat in the attributes. Oneness in the attributes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has attributes. He has told us his 99 of his attributes. But it does not mean that he is limited to 99 attributes. These are the attributes that he has told us through the words of this blessed messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there is Tawheed in that. There's oneness in that. What does it mean? Nobody shares these attributes. You can ask a question, what does it mean? Oh, you know, if Allah Ta'ala is merciful, then people are merciful as well. What does it mean then? Huh? We are saying Tawheed Fisifat. What does it mean that Allah Ta'ala, nobody shares the attributes of Allah? It means that the way, the way that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has those attributes, nobody, nobody shares that, those attributes. The way that Allah Ta'ala is merciful, nobody can be that merciful. The way that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala provides, nobody can provide. Of course, we can say that, you know, we are working in a company and it, it, this job provides me. Uh, it, it provides me. Fine, it's okay to say that. But the way Allah Ta'ala provides, nobody can provide. In fact, they are controlled by Allah Ta'ala. The mercy of people is controlled by Allah Ta'ala. Allah Ta'ala puts the share of His mercy in the hearts of the people. That's why they are merciful. So nobody shares the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's alone. And there are few <coughs> attributes there nobody shares at all. Nobody shares at all. The way that he is knowledge, but he's Alim. He's Ra'ul. He's Rahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is also Ra'ul and Rahim. He's also merciful. Allah ta'ala says about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But... That being Ra'uf and that being Rahim, that being merciful is not the way that Allah Ta'ala is a Ra'uf and a Rahim. Nobody shares the attributes that are of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Nobody can. And this is what exactly Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٌ There is nobody like him. There is nobody, there is nothing that is like Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. You cannot even imagine for a second that this attribute that people have is the same as the attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wahu was Samiul Alim. He is the one who is Sami all hearing. He is the one who is Alim all knowing. His knowledge is infinite. It's only a word, infinite. That's what we can our mind can comprehend. But we cannot even comprehend the attributes that he has. Nobody shares that. And then he moves on. He says, Wala shay'a mistuhu. وَلَا شَيْءَ يُعْجِزُهُ وَلَا إِلَهَ غَيْرُهُ I've already spoken about it. That وَلَا شَيْءَ مِثْلَهُ There is nothing like him. وَلَا شَيْءَ يُعْجِزُهُ There is nothing that can make him incapable. There is nothing that can make him incapable of doing anything. وَلَا إِلَهَ غَيْرُهُ And there is no God other than him. So the reason that he has come up with these points is that, you know, as I was saying, the Jahmiya, they deny the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they say that, oh, if the sifat are put, that you cannot believe in the tawheed of Allah ta'ala. Yani, there are 99 sifat. So what does it mean, 99 sifat and Allah? So it, yani, they say they cannot prove oneness of Allah. But... They're strong. You know, Allah Ta'ala has attributes. Attributes are something else. Sifat are something. Zat is something. The essence is something. And the attributes are something. This one man, and he has attributes. You know, right? He's, he's generous. He's brave. He's, he's soft. They're attributes. Same man, one essence, and the attributes. So that was a very wrong aqidah that Jahmiya had. So this is what he is saying. That is what he is saying that... There is nothing like him. Nothing makes him incapable. La ilaha ghayruhu. There is nothing like him. Yani in other words, all of his sifat are true. And the, he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has those sifat. But those sifat are those sifat that those attributes are those attributes. And there is nobody who shares those attributes. Wala shayya mislahu. There is nothing like him. Those attributes cannot be taken as the attributes that people have. 
but he does have attributes. And then nothing can make him incapable. <laughs> yani, he is complete in his qudrat. He is complete in his qudrat. He has the power over everything. An incapability. In what does incapability mean? That somebody has a weakness. I have a weakness. That's why I'm incapable of, say, studying one book in one hour. I'm incapable of doing that. I have a weakness in doing that. That's why I'm incapable of doing that. Ma'azallah, if we say that Allah Ta'ala is incapable of doing something, that means he's a weakness, Ma'azallah. He does not have a weakness. Nothing can make him incapable. He is not incapable of doing anything. He has the capability of everything. He's power over everything. There is nothing that is hidden from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Fatir, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعْجِزَهُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَلَا فِي الْأَرْضِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ عَلِيمًا قَدِيرًا That there is nothing that can make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala incapable of, of anything. In the heavens and in the earth. إِنَّهُ كَانَ عَلِيمًا قَدِيرًا He is alim, he is the knowledge of everything and he is the power over everything. If somebody has knowledge of everything and somebody has the power of everything, then how can Allah Ta'ala become incapable of doing anything? Jazakumullah wa akhru da'wana and alhamdulillah wa jihad.